thank you for the uh, invitation, Tim, to be with you today uh, to share. It's lovely to see some familiar faces. In fact, I've known some of you more than 30 years. I can't believe it. Uh, I've known some of you for about 18 months and some I haven't met yet. So uh, it's lovely, though, to be sharing with you in worship today. Uh, I work with Churches of Christ in Victoria and Tasmania. I uh, wonder if you realise that there are 130, around 130 churches across our two states. Uh, today they're all sharing together as you have in worshipping our God, in breaking bread together, in opening up his word. And uh, be encouraged that you're part of a, a family of churches where uh, Jesus is honoured, uh, the Bible is preached and God is glorified. Uh, but it's so good to be with you in your new church building. I can't believe it. I, and I mean I can't believe it. Last time I was here, I think it was a basketball court or something like that. Uh, and, and I walked in today and it literally took my breath away. It's beautiful. Can I tell you that? It's beautiful. It doesn't look like an old basketball court made to try to look like a chapel. It looks like a purpose-built chapel. Uh, but it's not just the facilities, which are, by the way, modern and contemporary and it speaks of relevance to our community. Uh, love, love the artwork. Who, who designed that? Is, who, who is it? Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, congratulations on that. Uh, it just, it, it's not about the building, folks. It, it, it speaks of a congregation willing to take a few risks for the sake of the gospel, not, not content to stay as they always have, knowing that because the world is changing, they too need to change. And this, this facility, this, this room that we're in today, worshipping God, speaks volumes to me as a visitor of a congregation who are willing to, to follow the lead of a, a fantastic pastor, some great leaders who are saying we're, we're ready to take the next step for God in this place. Congratulations. Uh, I, I don't know if you, you realise that there are other churches looking at you and wanting to learn from you about how to become a relevant church. And there's a group of leaders coming down from the ballerine to meet with uh, Tim when is it, Tim, next week or the week after? Uh, because they heard Tim speak at our recent conference uh, about the last few years of this church's history. And, and people are saying, we, we want to come and learn and see what you're doing so that maybe God would use uh, that sort of input in our local setting. Uh, I, I'm really proud of this church. I'm proud of Tim. We've been mates for a long time. Uh, I'm not surprised by his leadership, but it's such a blessing to see God using uh, you people uh, in a wonderful, relevant way uh, here at Peel Street Church of Christ. So it's good to be here. I was reading a book recently and the author uh, made this statement, what would happen if we got better at the two things Jesus said matter most. What, what would happen if we got better at the two things Jesus said uh, matter most? Now, of course, he was talking about uh, the answer to a question that Jesus uh, was, was asked. It was in our Bible reading today about which is the most important commandment. And Jesus responded to that question by, by saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbour as yourself. Jesus is saying that for Christians, these are the two most important things. These are the things that matter most. Now, as churches and as individual Christians, we, we can tend at times to complicate the Christian faith, can't we? You know, we, we can get busy doing all sorts of things, uh, all sorts of activities, which in themselves might be good 
and, and wholesome, but we may just fail to do the two things Jesus says matter most. Jesus kept it really simple. Number one, love the Lord your God with, with all your heart. Give everything to that. And, and number two, love your neighbour with just as much passion. So let me ask us all today, including myself, what would happen if we got better at the two things Jesus says matter most? Well, today I want to focus on the second of these two commandments. Love your neighbour. As you listen to the teaching of Jesus, you discover that our neighbours include those people we like and those people we don't like so much. It includes people who are the same as us and it includes people who are different to us. Loving your neighbour is simple, but that doesn't mean it's always easy or convenient. But it is one of the two things Jesus says matter most. Well, today I want to narrow the focus on this commandment down from love your neighbour, because I think sometimes we can think, well, yeah, everyone's my neighbour. I, I want to narrow it down and talk about your literal neighbour, my literal neighbour, the person next door, the person over the back fence, the person across the road. You can see them, can't you, even as I'm saying that, that the person who God has put in close proximity to you. Uh, what does it mean to love our literal neighbour? Now, today, you're going, to be, you, you're, you're going to be really pleased to hear. I'm not going to preach a sermon. I'm just going to tell three stories, and then I'm going to bring a challenge. Three stories and a challenge. Story number one comes under uh, the title, What Would Jesus Do? We were living in Mildura when our children were young. Uh, I was the minister at the Mildura Church of Christ, and there was a family who lived across the street and down two doors. Uh, there, there was a husband and a wife and two teenage boys. Now, I, I didn't know their names, but, but you know, we would wave as we drove past and they would wave if I was out doing the gardening, uh, but I'd never actually met them or got to speak to them. Uh, we saw the kids playing out the front of their house uh, from a distance. They seemed like really nice people. Uh, we, we had been neighbours for four or five years, but I did not know their names. One Saturday evening, we got the terrible news that a 19-year-old footballer had died during a football game that day in Mildura. Subsequently, we discovered that the boy was one of the sons in this family. You, you know what it's like when tragedy strikes close to home? I mean, we didn't know them, but they, they, they were our neighbours. And I knew that I wanted to do something, but I didn't know what to do. So what would Jesus do? We read in the Bible how Jesus constantly bumped into people and got to know them and shared his life with them. I love the message translation that speaks of Jesus in this way. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighbourhood. The reason that Jesus told us that loving our neighbour was one of the most important things that we could do is because he believed it and he lived it. So what would Jesus do? Let me just uh, show you the, the report from the local newspaper uh, on the Monday morning. And uh, this was young Jason who'd been killed. 
Well, I plucked up the courage and walked across the road and knocked on the door. And I introduced myself and gave my condolences. And I, I just said, look, I don't know what to do, but I, I am a minister. If there's anything I can do, I'm here to help. Well, to cut a long story short, they invited me into their home and into their grief and ultimately asked me to conduct uh, the largest funeral service I've ever conducted. Over 2,000 people gathered at the local football ground to say farewell to this uh, young man. Uh, and it turned out to, to be an amazing opportunity to represent the love and the the grace and the comfort of, of our Lord. Um, God, God did use me in those tragic circumstances. But, you know, afterwards, as I, as I thought about this uh, circumstance, I, I reflected on the fact that I didn't even know their names. And, and just as importantly, they didn't know there was someone across the street they could turn to if they had a need and if they wanted help. So as you think about your neighbours and the command of Jesus to love them, can I encourage you to regularly ask the question, what would Jesus do? My second story comes under the heading, love your neighbour who is more like you than you realise. I want to take you back about five years. Our youngest daughter, Abby, uh, this was before she was married um, and when she was still living at home. I've got a photo of Abby just to show you who I'm talking about, um, the, the delight of our lives. Uh, and Abby came to Julie and me this day and she had been to a conference, Christian conference, and she'd been convicted by God that we should get to know our neighbours better. And so she said, Mum and Dad, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to door knock our street and I'm going to invite all of our neighbours to our place next Sunday afternoon for afternoon tea. Now, you've got to understand that Julie and I are not exactly open house type people. I mean, we love people, yes, but, but you know, um, that, that's not our natural Bent. So we had a few uh, objections that we raised. Now, Abby, what if no one comes? Now, that, that you know, is a possibility and, you know, you're just going to get disappointed. Uh, what if only one person comes? That would be just plain embarrassing. And then what if a few people come but no one talks to each other? That could be awkward. And anyway, what are we supposed to do? Are we going to have games or, you know... And she was totally undeterred. She door knocked our whole street up and down both sides. And next Sunday afternoon, to our surprise, 15 people turned up. And they talked to each other. And they all turned out to be really nice people. And we did nothing religious at all, except that when it came to afternoon tea, Abby asked me to say thanks to God for our food. And at the end of what was about an hour and a half, uh, people started to leave and all of them were saying the same thing. This has been so good. We must do it again. Ah, you know, remember the words of Jesus in response to that question, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Uh, this is the first and greatest commandment. But then he said, and the second is like it, love your neighbour as yourself. Now, what did he mean, love your neighbour as yourself? Well, what he was actually saying is this, love your neighbour who is more like you than you realise. Get to know that person who looks different to you or who believes different to you. Uh, get to know them. You might just be surprised at how much you have in common. Break down that barrier that is between 
you and your neighbour. And you might just discover a frail, broken human being just like you, just like me, someone who's looking for a friend. Love your neighbour who is more like you than you realise. Well, my third story comes under the title, Who is at your dinner table? Now, I've got to go back about four years, maybe three and a half years now. Our second youngest daughter, Liesl, still living at home just before she got married. Uh, I've got a photo here of Liesl. And uh, Liesl uh, had been for a walk around the block one evening and she came in and she said that she had just met a lonely old man who lived down the street and she had invited him for dinner the next night. Now, I had some questions. Lisa, who is this man? Uh, she, she said he's, he's an old guy. Uh, he lives down the street. I got chatting to him. He seems to be really lonely, seems to be really nice, and, and I've invited him for dinner tomorrow night. I said, uh, Lisa, when you say old, how old is he? She said, oh, I don't know, 50 or 60. I said, well, Lisa, Lisa, you can't go asking lonely old men in the street to come home for dinner. It, it's, you're an attractive young woman. You just you are so naive, Lisa. 24 hours go by and there is a ring at the doorbell. I answer the door and there stands Eddie. I'll never forget his first words. I cannot believe there are people in the world who would invite someone like me for dinner. I said, Eddie, it's what we do. It's what we do. <laughs> Eddie, Eddie, it turns out, was 74 years of age. He had lost his wife 12 months earlier and was deeply in grief and very, very lonely. And we had a lovely time getting to know Eddie that night. He invited me to his place the next afternoon to show me his paintings. He's an artist. And so I went over and, and saw his paintings, including one of his wife, uh, and, and we developed a friendship. It, it was a few weeks later that Eddie said to me, you know, I, I, I wouldn't mind trying going to church with you one day. He'd never been a churchgoer. And I'll never forget the morning when Julie and I were sitting, as we always did, in the second front row. And Eddie turned up a little bit late and he walked down into the row and sat beside us. And that is where he sat every Sunday after that. Well, where else would he sit? He's our neighbour. You know, it, it's a beautiful story for me of what it can look like when you not only get to know your neighbour, but you get to know them reasonably well. Often it happens best over a cup of coffee or over, a din over the dinner table. So who's at your dinner table? In the book that I mentioned earlier, the author uh, asks this question, does the audience at your dinner table look like the audience at Jesus' dinner table? So often we read in the Bible of Jesus sharing a meal with someone that he has just met. Um, you remember the story of Zacchaeus? You do, don't you? He was different. He, he was a person that people didn't like and they had good reason for not liking him. And we read uh, in, in Luke chapter 19 uh, the story, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. He was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up 
and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. And it was over a meal that he got to know Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus got a whole lot more than he bargained for because he received life over a meal with the Saviour. It was over a meal that Jesus often would get to know people and people would get to know him. And just, just as you read your New Testament, just take a note of how often Jesus shares a meal. So the question is, who is at your dinner table? And, and, and there's my three stories, simple stories. What would Jesus do? Love your neighbour who is more like you than you realise. Who is at your dinner table? So what would happen if we got better at the two things Jesus said matter most? I think it's a really good question. Uh, what would happen if as churches and as individual Christians we started to narrow the focus down to the two simple things Jesus said matter most. Love the Lord your God with all your being and love your neighbour with just as much passion. Now, friends, today you have learnt something about me, haven't you, through my three stories. Um, I'm, I'm actually quite good at a whole lot of things that I do in the church, but I am so slow at doing one of the things that Jesus said matter most. Uh, I, I'm a slow learner when it comes to loving my neighbour and particularly my literal neighbour. So as I bring you a challenge today, I'm bringing myself exactly the same challenge and it's this, love your neighbour, your literal neighbour, uh, the person over the back fence or beside you, or down the street, the one you don't yet know, the one who God will bring into your, your view, your vision, your proximity. What does it mean to love them? And here's my challenge. Th think about that person. I, I reckon some of you already know who it is. So, some of you need to just keep your eyes open this week because you'll see them and pray for them. Lord, bless that person. Bless that person. Lord, you love them. H help me to have compassion and love for them also. Pray for that person. A and maybe pray the prayer. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do with your neighbour? Secondly, second part of the challenge, get to know their name. Now, you might have to be a bit creative in doing that. Uh, it might be embarrassing. Say, look, I've known. We've been here for five years. And I still, don't, still don't know. Or I, I, I introduced myself three years ago. I forgot. What's your name again? Get to know their name. Write it down so that you can pray for them in person. And then ask God to give you an opportunity to get to know their story. Because once you get to know their story, and they get to know your story you'll probably discover you have a lot in common and as a Christian person, you'll have an opportunity to represent the love, the grace and the compassion of our Saviour. Be creative in finding a way to love your neighbour. So there's the challenge, okay? Step out of your comfort zone. David, come on, David. Come on, each one. Walk across the road if it need, need be, pray about it, look for an opportunity and, and love your neighbour. By the way, coffee, what is it? Coffee and cake. Folks, no brainer, no brainer. Would you come to an afternoon tea with me? Best food in Ballarat. Uh, all of us could do that and just see what God might do. Uh, it's a challenge. It's important. Why? because it's one of the two things that Jesus said matter most. Let me pray. Father, we thank you today for the simplicity of the gospel. 
We thank you that Jesus makes it easy, not hard, that it's simple, not complex. And I pray that you would help each one of us, each one of us this week, to have eyes open and, and, and hearts ready to respond to the neighbour who you put on our heart. I pray this blessing for my brothers and sisters today and for myself in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.